and welcome to the AEW Dynamite Review. We are the Dudley Boys of What Culture. I'm Adam Wilborn, joined by Michael Hamblet and Michael Sidgwick here to review everything that happened on last night's episode of AEW Dynamite. But before we get into it, if you're a fan of this sort of thing, make sure you subscribe to What Culture Wrestling on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and YouTube, <sighs> where we do daily wrestling podcasts where we not only review AEW Dynamite, but also AEW Collision, Raw, SmackDown, the show formerly known as NXT Dewpoint. Oh! Pay-per-views, premium live events. We have interviews, roundtable discussions, and a roundup of the week complete with a bigger quiz, of course, on wrestle culture. As I said, they're joined by Hamlet and Sidgwick to review last night's Dynamite. Sidgwick, what did you make of the show? Um, as succinctly as I can say it, I was way, way more encouraged than mm. I was blown away, but I was very encouraged. Like I don't think this is an absolutely fantastic, must-see episode in and of itself, but it was just... Uh, just encouraging mm. certain plot developments, certain approaches to things felt like a low-key response to criticism that wasn't just, you know, here's some match graphics or mm. whatever. Um, that just felt like they were trying to really get some basics uh, correct here. Yeah, it didn't pull the rug out from underneath everything going on, did it? We did the preview yesterday and we talked about MJF's tweet in which he sort of, what was it, restore the feeling? Yes. He was, it was his quest to restore the feeling. He didn't, you can't just do that on a wrestling show. We were saying, well, a lot of people don't want you to just drop the devil for that. And you can't just, well, you can, you but can't, it certainly ruins can. a lot of other things. Uh, and I, yeah, I'm with Sidgwick. Like, I think, contrary to uh, what some people believe, I don't think we've been anywhere near as low on AEW as consensus. Like, I did ups and downs last week with hardly any downs. Sidge today, the same. Eight and two. Like, I think these shows are not as terrible as they sometimes first appear by their awful segments. Hmm. Yeah, like you say, I think signs of encouragement on this show. Nothing, well, elements of blowaway stuff, as always, with, with in-ring, with AEW. But yeah, nothing astonishing, but nothing that was so outright, oh my God, what are you doing here? Uh, but I'm sure we'll maybe, get into maybe, it. Maybe one. We'll get into, yes, I was going to say, into it in due course. Uh, let's start at the beginning of the show with uh, the latest match in the Gold League of the Continental Classic. It was John Moxley versus Jay Lethal. Uh, I think a match, I assume... Looked fairly obvious going in of who was going to win, but they did a very intriguing bit of booking in terms of, well, you talked in the office today about Moxley being in trouble. Well, I'll let you get into that in a second. Because early on, uh, Lethal targets the legs. He puts on a figure four. They roll to the outside. That bump always looks like it sucks because you just legs wrapped together. That's going to hurt. There's angles on that. That's going to hurt. Uh, Lethal's in control, hits a dive, but does a bit of a strut, and that allows Moxley to hit a dive of his own and looks... Really, I don't know if this was planned in advance, but the way he landed and sort of mm. jerked his leg back, um, which Danielson on commentary uh, pointed out, um, was something that Lethal then zoned in on. Knee breaker, drag and screw, uh, another knee breaker, followed by a top rope elbow for a two. Um, Moxie goes out to the apron and Lethal sends him into the front row to take us to a break. When we come back, Moxie's in trouble. A sort of desperation cutter uh, gets him back into it. Lethal goes for another dragon screw off the second rope. Uh, he goes for a drop kick, does Lethal, but Moxley sidesteps it and hits him with a big King Kong lariat. Goes for the uh, Death Rider. Lethal counters into a lethal combination. He wants a figure four, but Moxley counters that with some roll-ups. They trade counters. Lethal got, gets him in a figure four, but Moxley gets to the ropes. Um, lethal kicks the leg out of his leg, goes for the lethal injection. Moxley collapse, uh, uh, but he was uh, sort of playing possum a little bit. Hits him with a lariat. Pile driver, rear naked choke, submission victory for Moxley. A, a harder task than we env env envisaged. Yes, I was not blown away by this match. Elements of it were a bit dry and boring and logical, and it wasn't really electrifying, and there was very, very little drama, I would have to say. I know they tried to tell the story. I just never really believed it. But conversely, I'm glad that story existed, potentially, for future use. This was, across the first 20 minutes, I, I thought really encouraging. Again, that is the theme of the mm. day. Uh, sign ahead of uh, the Continental Classic. I've watched John Moxley for four years in AEW, and he's cursed, as is every single person who has ever been on episodic TV ever. At some point, you're going to get a bit bored of someone you watch mm -hmm. 52 weeks a year, multiple years. Absolutely no one ever has ever been immune from this. Even wrestlers you like now or who are hot now, they go through it. Everyone goes through it. It's the it's the inherent flaw of the model. I'm there with Moxley right now, unfortunately, which is such a shame. 
The guy's still incredible. Mm. He's like one of the best ones you think from afar. Um, but in this match, which I, again, didn't think it was electrifying, it was logical and well told. And I think Moxie did a good job selling it as well. Um, I'm praying to give some sporting heft to this tournament, and we got a little bit of that. I cannot wait to put over what we saw immediately after this match. If Moxley decides to sell that knee throughout, we could be cooking here. Mm. That's sport, that as well. It's Wrestling is a pseudo sport. Um, and I just liked watching him not be this sort of cold, almost indifferent feeling, mercenary badass who's mean and tough and I'll kick everyone's ass like John Moxley there are a bit of the Bob Hollies about him in mm. 2023 I'll just beat everybody he barely even talks it can get a bit repetitive redundant some of those wins a lot of the time just that flash of vulnerability I enjoyed mainly for what it means going forward rather than in the moment but also I liked him outsmarting people I missed the John Moxley he will tell you how he's going to beat you Hide how he's going to beat you, and then beat you. Mm. It's the idea of like, again, I don't like the tweener mocks. I don't like the heel mocks. That whip smart baby face who can play possum or can sort of like um, bait his leg as he did throughout here. I've missed baby face characteristics Moxley, and we got more out of that, even if the match was there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I was. I realised with Moxley selling here that I'm very willing to buy into bit of a lie of the Continental Classic. The obvious comparisons to the G1 are rooted in the fact that this is tournament wrestling and, you know, you've got to get the most points, but you've got to go through real physical hardships in order to do it. But the G1 does that by making wrestlers wrestle every other day, or you're always on that. You're traveling to the next show where you're going to wrestle, and then you're traveling to the next show. It's like mm. an unrelenting schedule. It was key to the John Moxley, Kenny Omega thing. Uh, you couldn't cope with the sheer force of will that you have to have to get through this tournament and stay fit and healthy. Did did John Moxley win that G1? No, well, I did. First try. First try. Indeed. The Continental Classic features AW wrestlers wrestling on identical schedules to the schedule <laughs> that they keep. It's a once-a-week thing. Yeah. But wrestling's a work. Right? So by John Moxley getting injured here, like he hasn't done, to Sidgwick's point about his vulnerability or lack thereof. Every week in 2023, it's suddenly put over the tournament as like slightly harder work than your standard weekly AW Dynamite match. So I can totally buy this. Like, I'm not saying this from a cynical approach. I am like open hearted to the idea of ah, oh, this tournament, these matches go a little bit harder because people want it a little bit more. So this isn't your standard go to work, win a match on Wednesday, see you next Wednesday. This is different, different gravy. Different gravy. And Moxley suffering the consequences of that puts this, as we, we get with Kingston next, puts this tournament over as not just a turning up to wrestle once a week. It's smart booking to try and elevate the, like, sort of like the status and the aura of the tournament, which was pretty much our biggest criticism of it last week. Mm. So, like, a hu I didn't think much of the match either, but a huge step in the right direction psychologically because everyone can sort of tell their own version of this same story. I know you're excited about what came next, Sige. Mm -hmm. uh, we see post-match comments after uh, Eddie Kingston's loss to Brody King on collision. He's sort of slumped in a hallway, uh, and he says, basically, maybe I got a little bit cocky, uh, heading into this tournament, putting all the belts on the line, making it a triple crown. You know, I've got, I've lost, and I've got Brian Danielson next. I'm kind of behind the eight ball, but no, I'm not going to complain. I'm going to be humble in victory, humble in defeat. Um, I've got Danielson next. Let's get healed up. I'll be ready. Uh, and then they cut to commentary. Yeah, Brian Danielson was on commentary uh, throughout the evening. And uh, he's got no sympathy, basically. He says, look, I was initially really impressed by uh, Eddie's confidence, putting all the belts on the line. And then he's taken one loss, and now he's behind the eight ball. I fractured my elbow bone in two places. I needed eye surgery. I'm coming into the tournament on fire. I'm not behind the eight ball. I'm coming to win. I'm not going to be humble in victory or defeat. I'm coming to win this tournament, and I will be the first AEW Triple Crown champion. Thank you. I needed this. There it I is, needed yeah. this tournament to feel like a tournament. I needed the stakes to feel absolutely like it, it, it. Eddie Kingston, the character, is facing this dire situation already, and so much of this is yet to play out. I couldn't have loved this more. First thing is that I kind of want to see, maybe it's just the New Japan mark in me, I want to see um, post-match, I have just been destroyed, I'm sweating, I don't look great, 
straight after the match promos every single week on this show. Mm. Like, make it, I don't want it to be glossy. I want to feel the wrestler's exhaustion, fatigue, yeah, they did pain. A bit of a super cut that, didn't they, on collision after last week? I need more of this. Yeah. Not, I want it to extend beyond the Continental Classic as well. Just yeah, sell what it is. Don't have everyone looking glossy all the time. Mm. Great. Like, I just love that. You really just believed in that moment because of the way in which it was presented, which was really inspired. You didn't just say all of this. And oh, here's Renee. Paquette back with Eddie Kingston days later. I really enjoyed that touch, specifically in the context of this tournament and his promo. And I just loved as well how already he's got a six-pointer. And this is early. We're not even at the, the, the huge stakes yet. And Eddie Kingston is the likable, before it turned into what it did now, the likable Newcastle United team of the mid-90s. Shut up, man. <laughs> Everyone does. Everyone, everyone yeah. loved them. Everyone's second team, even yeah. Hamlets. <laughs> Absolutely not, and I will not have that going on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and they are the twelve point lead. Ah, it's going away. I like that bit. That that twelve point lead is going away. And Brian Danielson, you know, there's probably other sporting analogies. He's the Chicago Bulls of the nineties. Mm. He's Manchester United. He's Sir Alex Ferguson. He's that uh, arrogant athlete who knows how good they are like the, the Michael Jordan mm. or Djokovic, mm. right? Mm. And he needs knocking off his f***ing <laughs> perch. <laughs> and he's not gonna, you're not going to do it first no. time, or you shouldn't. But at the same time, Kingston, he can't lose two of the bounds. What about the belt? Couldn't have loved this more. And I'm fired up, genuinely. I am me. I am fired up for Kingston Danielson on Saturday. Sunday, I can't wait to watch that on Sunday morning, genuinely. Cannot wait. I'm setting the alarm. It was a subtle pivot in the stakes here, and I think they're going to get to go back. They That's start sport, baby. <laughs> well, it's sport, right? And sport is for prizes, and the prize is the triple crown. But that never, ever really felt like something worth winning, which was a huge problem undermining how they were all talking about the Continental Classic. And... Eddie Kingston, in one backstage promo, made you realise, oh, you're the one that's got the belt, so it's actually about you. Mm. It's about Eddie Kingston. Now, that's a prize that I'm invested in, is like the, the soul of Eddie Kingston, basically. I'm more invested in that than a belt that you haven't even had designed yet and hides under a sheet, and these two titles that are pretty much meaningless to me. Now, right now, it's with Eddie Kingston, but because it's with Eddie, it's going to go back to the belts, so that gets the Triple Crown prize over as you follow Kingston through the tournament. So I think they've done a fantastic job here, not just of make it, and Brian was superb. So that basically two of the best talkers have talked to you and want to watch them wrestle. That's the way you're supposed to do all this. But the prize itself, which is going to help everybody else in the tournament, is now bigger than it was before. It's Kingston's um, belief in himself, and it's Kingston hopefully recovering and making a go of it in this tournament. And it's also the prize that he's going to fight for. We would assume probably as far, like, to the end, to the mm. semifinals at least, I care more about this tournament over the course of, like, two guys talking than I did at any point in the first six and a bit matches. Yeah. Like, this was like this was thoughtful. They knew what they were doing here. The timing of this is so wonderful mm -hmm. because you know it's going to peak higher than this. Yeah. Mm. Earned me some trust, some sporting motifs. The desperation is <laughs> Love it. It's like you say, you can't afford to really go two down, but when it gets to the that point... Gonna do. When it gets to the point where it's like oh, no, literally, you lose this game and you're out of the tournament. Mm -hmm. How desperate are people going to become? How how much of a, oh, that's kind of cutting corners, but, you know, the only thing that history remembers is whether you won or lost, really. So, you know, people are going to look at Danielson and go, got a hurty eye, have you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know I'm suggesting that's going to be Kingston, but the desperation that's going to creep in across... Everyone, apart from the losers who are probably going to go 0-5 in this yeah, tournament. Yeah, up in Mirrors the Punk match, and he does a before the belt hurricane to Brian's broken eye. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> screams. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of conflicted with what came next, because it was, like, exciting, and they, they sold this big final match for Sting, but I also got three old men kind of waffling on at the same time. Weekend at Rick's. It was Tony Giovanni, he's, he's talking about uh, AW Revolution, and they announced it's going to take place March 3rd, Greensboro Coliseum, obviously the history there uh, for, for Sting, many memorable matches, and of course Sting and Flair 35 years ago, uh, and he brings in both men. Uh, I should have done the maths on the combined age on screen here, really. And he talks about Sting's incredible, what is he, 24-0 record in AEW? Never had a title shot. 
And um, this is what we're doing. It's like I said the other week. That he young, heel Young Bucks versus Sting and Derby. Or, <laughs> gonna say Sting. Or, or, or the belt on a heel and Sting fighting for the world title. Heel Young Bucks in Greensboro as well. It's, that's, that that is the match. I think it'll be a singles world title, but I think that's the better <laughs> Split match. Second there, I thought he was going to say Heel Young Bucks versus Sting and Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to see Rick Flair again as long as I live. Um, so, yeah, Sting says, like, I'd never guessed all these years later uh, after that first world title match. Uh, I'd be standing here with, with the two of you. Talks about it being 45 minutes, commercial free, uh, really uh, original, first time that's really ever been done. And, and um, it always was a make or break night for him. Uh, he talks about Rick putting him on the map. He thanks both men. He says, this is a fitting place to end my career. And I'm like, okay, cool. There we go. See, see you, see you, revolution. Uh, and then they sort of just keep going and keep going and keep going. Like Flair talks, talks about, you know, I didn't make him, Sting made himself... Uh, I'm, you know, I'm lucky to be standing here, 74 years old. Uh, it's going to be one of the greatest moments of my life. Uh, Sting's last match. How A5 is going to be lined up. This is like glimpses of Ric Flair of old in there. Uh, and they sort of get it back on track by going, oh, Sting and AW are coming to Greensboro. Woo, all that. And Tony throws back to commentary. He just felt like it kind of lost its way somewhere. What, a Ric Flair promo? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't um, before 20 years ago, lost its way. <laughs> You're joking. Yeah, I hate seeing him. But they're not allowed to get me with the Greensboro Coliseum. Yeah. So they're, they're trying. Maybe it's working. Like a bit of romance in my wrestling. He's going to be an event. It's going to be, like, Ric Flair aside, it's going to be a really, really, like, quite beautiful thing. I I think they might, like, sod the tag match, sod Darby Allen. I think the, the heel will be the world champion by then. Might, they might just go for it. Sting's one and only singles match, and it's for the heel bucks for like you want uh, that's the best the match. possible yeah. match. You need Derby to create that movement. It's going on last as well, I think. It should, as it should. like it's the whole show yeah. shape it around. There's no stories that are going to be that hot and peak that high by Revolution that you might. The as young well. bucks might need this. Yeah, you might as well just go with Sting all in for the promotion for this pay per view. Two hundred and four years. Two hundred and four years. Oh boy, by Nigel Cambridge. Thank you for that. Two hundred one of those are Ric Flair. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I did see, by the way, uh, Adam Blair at Adam Wilton 4, who usually takes care of the... Um, Dada. Dada. For uh, Ladies Night, which is... <laughs> I saw the red light. <laughs> still still coming. Uh, red light indicates Dada secure. <laughs> uh, off, he said he's booked his hotel. He's, he's going there. Well, well fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Hell Hell stinger. Uh, and then we got another Gold League match in the Continental Classic. It was uh, Mark Briscoe versus Roosh, who uh, chopped the crap out of each other. <laughs> Basically. I love Roosh so much, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, back and forth slugfest to kick us off. Uh, Roosh is trying to do a pose, so Briscoe just clotheslines him out to the floor and flies through the ropes with a drop kick. More chops. Roosh sends uh, Briscoe into the barricade. Briscoe responds with a back suplex onto the edge of the barricade and a diving elbow off the apron. R.I.P. <laughs> Mark Briscoe's hips. Um they trade thrust kicks, lariat, double down. Uh, we go to picture in picture when we come back. Briscoe hits an exploder. Ro Roosh hits a backdrop driver. Goes for bullhorns, but uh, Briscoe fires out of the corner with a spear. Goes for the J-driller. Roosh escapes. Uh, so Bris Briscoe hits him with an enziguri. He uh, sends Roosh to the apron. More chops. Um, he uh, hits Roosh with an overhead throw to the floor. <sighs> they fight in the corner. Um, Roosh gets knocked off uh, the turnbuckle. Briscoe hits the froggy bow for a two count. Roosh again gets out of the J-driller. Overhead throw into the ropes. Bulls horns, one, two, three. Roosh gets three points on the board. God, Roosh. Oh, God damn it. Yeah. Love him. <laughs> <laughs> Roosh is the wrestler probably just by his merely existing. Makes me go. He's the one. Just bleed. Like it goes, uh, if I went like that, on someone's chest, I'd think... What are you doing? <laughs> Roosh, with that exact same physical, just does a better job than Gunther. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't, but nearly. Pretty good. Half yeah. the time, after, actually. Maybe it's a very close call. Like, for f the first four minutes or something, I'm thinking, when was the last time I watched a back-and-forth TV match, which these days is very patterned. Very, you just know how it's going to go. You know you know any of the finish. You see them do certain sequences and then obviously the signatures and when they do them and then maybe the second time and then reverse finisher you could basically if you just sat and just like i don't know try to get out of the moment 
You could analyze it. You go, right, there, you know, four minutes away from the finish, three minutes, two minutes. The first five minutes, I think it's end now. Mm. I'm really locked in. This action's so believable. It's so intense. It's like ferocious. Like, what if, what if they just did seven hog wild minutes? <laughs> and then Roosh got what, if he's, if he's selling that leg in that way, and he's making me feel like, oh, God, is he going to finish this match? I don't think he is. He's probably took a knock. If he's selling that, and it's mm. a complete fabrication, a complete work, strap him up. <laughs> I'm living and dying with my man. Rush, he's amazing. <laughs> but when he did get the leg injury, this slowed down. But, so it's gone from this absolutely ferocious, just, just bleed sprint. And then the leg injury happens. Mm. Then it becomes this, like, accidentally good match where you're kind of, like, willing them over the line mm. to get it done. And I tell you what, like, you can call Mark Briscoe a master without any hyperbole whatsoever if you look at his body of work for the like, over this century, right? His ability to, like, just... It didn't ever look like he was just maybe at the odd time, but mostly he didn't really look like he was just waiting for Rush's leg to get better. Mm. Like, he knew exactly when to sell, when to kind of fold and collapse. Like, he just... I think he deserves all the credit in the world, Mark Briscoe, for knowing where I can... So luckily, those four, first four minutes went as hard as they did because I can do like a delayed exhaustion cell here and just kind of do it as I'm waiting for Roosh to get properly back into it. And I'll tell you what was awesome as well is that you've got Roosh who's basically on one leg for, what, 60% of this match, 50% of this match, and then you're thinking, like you saw Samson out there, you're thinking, Jesus Christ, this is uh, is this, is this got a bit awry? And then he just bashes him power back into his leg, gets the adrenaline flowing, and somehow contrives to hit a bull's horn. Yes. <laughs> that I'm thinking, how one, how did that not concuss Mark Briscoe? <laughs> Bloody up his face. It was the, the impact was amazing. But Brian Danielson lost his mind. Yes. And it's one of my favorite things ever when you've got an actual worker, and <laughs> Brian Danielson's one of the best workers of all time. When you can get someone who knows how it's done, who knows how to make it look like Danielson does, mm. and have him, of all people, the most foremost authority in how to do these things and make them look deadly. If you've got him, like, sincerely losing it <laughs> and going, oh, my goodness, look at that. I d there's nothing more impressive to me when there's a commentator who's a worker who loses their mind and actually is into it. <clears throat> Calling for people's heads on commentary tables and disciplinary panels. He's got the lot, Brian. <laughs> the my expectations. Such a bitch, man. My it's always everyone are, except CM Punk who's to blame, isn't it? The grass isn't greener; it's burgundy. Uh, my uh, my <laughs> CM Punk's a violent sociopathic thug. Oh god, everyone's such a loser. My <laughs> expectations this match were measured because I'm a dumbass. Like I really was thinking. Oh, this is not the right week. This is not the right pairing. As it's always the right week for this. As great as they both are, this oh, I was just miles, miles off. Um, Mark Brisk, I don't have anything to add on Roosh, like, but I love him just the same. Like, he's that guy right now, Roosh. I think he's Force of nature. So valuable for this tournament as well, because there are going to be weeks where, like, the fixture doesn't feel quite as From fulfilling. From the first Roosh Mox match. Yeah. Last year. Like, oh it, my God. he's perfect for this. Such a perfect addition. Mark Briscoe, as a baby face, like he's a, he's a WWE dream in a way that they can't train. They want their wrestlers to find hard cameras, find people in the crowd, find that emotion mm. that like Dusty Rhodes we know would train out of people, would find in them, and they just like stole it and thought, well, there's a big camera, like I'm doing now, look at that, mm. and then like pull a face, and that's how they'll emote, and it's all wrong and it feels fake. Briscoe does that naturally. He does that, like, he absolutely pulls you through the screen for him. John Cena, when he was like, well, if I call my spots loud, then somebody in Rose Ed hears it. You've missed the point, John. Yeah. Like, Mark Briscoe is wrestling like that the actual mm. way you're supposed to do it. I'm as shocked as he is when people kick out the froggy bar. Yeah, like, he's, oh. na he's nailed that. It's so just, good. like, it, it probably, and like, I'm as guilty as anybody else, like, we did not talk about the Briscoes enough, and we do not talk about Mark Briscoe as an all-timer. Mm. Like, really, when you he's sit down so and drill into it. great. This isn't just a guy that's been on TV a year. He's put 20 years into this, so of course he's as great as he is. Uh, and, again, I am viewing this tournament through someone like a Kingston and now somebody through a Briscoe as if it is as real as real sport gets. Please turn it around. Like, please turn this into a three and two rather than a, like, I don't want you to get beat every week. I don't want it to be another Mark Briscoe, neighbor, like, neighbor so far story mm. at, like, 
I, I desperately will be willing him to win his next match, and that's the point of tournaments like this. Superb. Uh, following that, RJ City's backstage with uh, Thomas Tony Storm, Luther, uh, and uh, Mariah May. Um, she's annoyed about her acceptance speech being interrupted last week, but she went out and partied at the compound with JFK or one of the Kennedys. She's exhausted. She's got a touch of the gout. Uh, RJ <laughs> asks if she's worried that she's got to defend her women's title next week. Uh, and Storm name drops some Hollywood stars and said, if they weren't worried, neither am I. Uh, and RJ takes off her shoes to end the segment, which got me worried about how the internet was going to react to this. <laughs> uh, but I did pop when Taz was like, hey, gout's no joke, guys. What do you make of all this? <laughs> She's literally playing someone from a different era in time. It's not timeless. She's like out of time. Back in time, Tony Storm. That more like it. <laughs> <laughs> if, any, if anything. No, I mean, it's stupid. It's absolutely stupid. Yeah. So, like, she obviously isn't. She lives in the era of our Lord 2023. Um, if you are... You know, someone like me, you know, exacting about the details or, you know, a complete and utter little <laughs> <laughs> you're, asking, it. you're asking questions that undermine the whole thing. Yes. And the idea of AW is this real place with real people playing characters, but, you know, you can believe in them. And it's like, oh, should, should someone not get some psychiatric help or something? Like, you know what I mean? It's Brandy Rhodes' teddy bear. Yeah. Needs to step in and do something about it. It's this. like, this is a, if, that's, if this is a real entity, a real organization, as compared to the, the synthetic one over there, mm. right? Which is their words, kind of, not mine. Yeah. Like, come on, this is ridiculous. Let's get this poor woman some help. <laughs> is that then, would you say that Tony Storm, it's not so much the character, it's... She's reflective of the big picture issues with an AW. She's in WWE, and they're doing this level of comedy, which is like a I timing's think, uh, great. Some of this made me laugh. Like, some of I this think some is like the touch of the gout, you know. Yeah. This is in a more fantastical world. All for it. Yeah. But the, the dissonance is too much for me. Good, this is it, because this segment, again, a bit like the acceptance speech last week, I like laughed. And I'm thinking, how have you done that? Like the gout thing. It's really funny. Uh -huh. Like, and uh, so as a result, I kind of have no problem with it at all as a segment. But I do see those exacting criticisms about should it live here. Mm. I'm glad it does. I want. I think I want the Continental Classic followed by this on a single wrestling show. But I do understand their criticisms. I think it's way back on track from when it was a couple of weeks before she won the belt. Mm. I thought like this was done. So I didn't love the follow up with Mariah May. I thought her performance was pretty wooden and fake feeling. Just when, talk about it now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Tony Storm was there. This is wooden and fake feeling. I, but again, it's like, I think she like makes Tony sense Storm's within the context of Yards herself. better. Yeah. Yards like, better in her performance of this Bobbins fake <laughs> stuff. So what were they all about Eve? I, which they have of, of, and I don't as good as Tremors. <laughs> I'm now wondering, I, I didn't watch it for Big research. Big Trouble in Little China. You know, I read one tweet. But like... Maybe Tony Khan not bother watching it because it looks like we're just getting there right now, doesn't it? Like Mariah May, annoyed about what Tony Storm said in the speech last week. Mm -hmm. Racing away to a title shot or, or yeah. what? RJ's backstage with her. She's hungry for more after coming off a run in stardom. Uh, and she's thankful, flirty almost with RJ for connecting her with Tony Storm. Uh, you're quite the curator of people, says Mariah. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. he goes, right, you go get him. And she goes into... Tony Khan's office. Yeah, so this is all about Eve. Yeah, and it's all about Eve. You know that um, AEW did like a Tremors one as well, which is William Regal's run. <laughs> was that a year ago? <laughs> was that a year ago yesterday? <laughs> By the way, did yeah. I see? Yeah, huh? uh, Triple B reveal, turn on yeah. Regal. Yeah, but Regal knew it was going to happen, so he's the real smartest, funniest, and hardest, yeah. so it's all right. Yeah, what did you make of the Mariah? I didn't like this bit as much. So it feels like they're rushing through something. But we'll see. Like, we'll let this play out for now, I guess. You might not be angling for a title shot. There might be a little twist along the way. I just thought there was a few more months in this rather than the next pay-per-view, <laughs> as it might now be. <laughs> World's end. Yeah. Wait a minute, you thought there was a few more months out of an AEW storyline? Yeah. That's weird, because yeah. you know, they all go on four years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, MJF comes down to the ring next. Uh, he's got a cane. 
He's got a partially torn labrum as well, as Excalibur mentions on commentary. He talks about his world title match against Samoa Joe uh, at World's End on December 30th. He says, look, Joe, I don't like him as a person, but as a pro wrestler, I respect him uh, for believing in AEW, not just want to line his pockets. Um, he talks about getting a poster in the mail uh, from TNA. And one person standing out in that company, the Samoan submission machine, he said uh, he wasn't the op- he wasn't awarded the opportunity to become world champion over there in WWE, um, but he also proved the point that you don't have to be this male model bodybuilder to be a champion. He paved the way for guys like me. Without Joe, they might not even be in AEW, uh, and he thanks him despite the fact that it kind of hurts him to do so. He uh, did say, "Well, I'm I'm pretty decent as well." Uh, for starting a new alternative, I helped build AW brick by brick since day one. I beat Rhodes, Punk, Danielson, Omega, Moxley. Uh, but of all of the names, the one I look back and consider my look, myself lucky to have survived was Joe. Uh, December 30th isn't about Joe's legacy, it's about his own. Can Maxwell Jacob Friedman survive the final boss one final time? He doesn't care if his left knee keeps sliding in and out or if his right hip keeps popping in and out of its socket. He doesn't care if he's it's King Gong and Godzilla all together. He's going to show the world it isn't about the size of the dog in the fight. It's about the size of the fight in the dog. Uh, and if Joe wants to take what's his at World's End, he's going to have to put him down. And he snaps his cane over his leg. Uh, and then the lights go out or they sort of start flickering at least. And then in come masked men with devil masks. Uh, one's holding a bat to take out... MGF potentially, but Joe appears and makes the save, and then the everything goes black, and then you see words on a screen. In the in the shadows, our game begins next week. MJF and Samoa Joe, will you face the unknown in a tag match? Are you a hero, Max? Uh, and Joe's like, don't do it. You need to be healthy for World's End. Uh, but MJF says he's sick of this Scooby Doo BS. He'll t- take out every single one of them. MJF accepts, and Joe's not very pleased with this. Everything before the devil stuff was really, really strong, I thought. Um, will you indulge me with a, a tortured football analogy? <laughs> oh, yes, please. Right, okay. Soccer. So MJF, for a while now, with that, like, I'm going to do mystery. I'm going to have loads of different, like, I'm going to line up lots of different challenges, and I need to focus on them and spin those plates and build them all up. And I'm going to do the most fighting from underneath performance at full gear you've ever seen in your life. He's been trying, and this is good. Fundamentally, if the execution isn't, he has been trying to score like, I don't know, like a 40 yard screamer every time. Mm. Or to use a basketball analogy, like three pointers, like everything that would make a highlight real. Mm. This time, he's just realized I've got a very simple job to do. I'm just going to roll one in, mm. back of the net. Nothing too fancy, nothing too ambitious, but you just need that goal. He needed to score the goal, and this is what he did here. He cut the most one-on-one, classic, basic, simple, whatever you want to call it, promo of all time. He's good, or they're good, I'm just better. Yes. Or Mm -hmm. they're good, I don't care, I'm still going to fight with my bloody heart out. And that was this promo, and it was really, really well done. He couldn't have done a better job, really, of putting over Samoa Joe as this, like, transformative, formidable threat. And he had to acknowledge the reality. Is that, what, 10 years of Samoa Joe's career? That was just crap. And he's spawned that because he's a carny, worker, wrestler, yeah. promoter. And he has said, like, he should have. I know he didn't, but he should have, obviously. Um, so everything up until the devil stuff was just... Route one, good, mm-hmm. basic, simple, classic stuff that you need to be doing, and it was so effective. And considering the last few weeks, like really refreshing. The, this devil stuff, I they stuck with it. I kind of just not do it. It's the only thing worse than doing like Dark Order and the Creepers and the Retribution is like um, Hornswoggle's a GM. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's, that's the that's the next worst thing. Hornswoggle's a GM, or you know, just whatever, like. What's another famous example of WWE just doing nothing with something? Or like taking that, a, that went on for friggin' ages as well, the anonymous GM. That's the most preeminent. That's the worst one, yeah, because they left it to die. Yeah. And then brought it back to pay it off as Hornswoggle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they're kind of they're stuck with it. And I will give them a tiny bit of credit here. They've listened to people go, Oh, so he's a hacker, or is he supernatural? Like, how is this devil, whoever it may be, just randomly appearing on the screen at the at, at a whim? 
And then they've done the flashing lights. Again, it, it was giving TNA. <laughs> it's giving Dark Order Creepers. <laughs> and then they've done the message on the video. And then the commentary team have explained that there's been some kind of internal hack or whatever, like between technological hacker stuff and supernatural bobbins stuff. It's about there in terms of how lame are we going. Yeah. <laughs> so they've gone the level below. That is something, I guess. Um, but I think in MGF basically hanging a lantern on, it's Scooby-Doo BS. They know. They are telling us we know, which indicates to me that they have faith in the reveal. Yeah. They have big-time faith in the reveal, but they are now at this point saying, yeah, visually it doesn't look good. i tell you what was a bit a miss here as well, other than the presentation, which is basically everything in pro wrestling, um, is that I understand why Joe came out. It made all the sense in the world. Mm -hmm. Joe wants the best version of Max because he's a different heel. By the way, I believe that Joe can beat him at World's End. So that's mm -hmm. a vast improvement on the yes. Jay White stuff altogether because MGF didn't make the promise that he'd win. He made the promise that he would try. Fundamentally different in terms of what they're signposting and sometimes telling you too much. Um, Joe helping him out because he wants to... Um, have MGF at his best, so he's got no excuses. His property. So, so, yeah. yeah, and Joe can look at himself in the mirror fundamentally the next day and say, I'll be the champion, mm. fair and square, whatever. So I understand why Joe did what he did and saved MGF from this attack. The devil and his cohorts or whatever should have kicked the hell out of MGF like a long time ago. They should have really brutalized somebody, anybody. I understand they tried this with the acclaim, but it looked naff. It looked naff. Um... I think with the presentation and the aesthetic, you would struggle badly to believe in them as this main event level stable or act, irrespective of what they do to one of the characters. But you kind of, you should try. Try. I, the scattering I couldn't make my mind upon. The f there were still four of them. You know, like four on the two. I know, I know Joe stole the back. There was four of them. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I couldn't decide if the scattering was what made them feel a bit more... Creepers, retribution, adjacent. Well, the scattering of the lights. No, of the wrestlers. Joe comes to make the save, and I know he pulls the guy. Oh, and they scream. And they scream. I was like, there's still four years. Mm. Like, you can get back in and you can take control of this and you can get exactly where you want to I mean, you can't do that to Joe, given what they've said about Joe. He's Godzilla and King Kong. Yeah. And I like Joe making the then save. Jeff about to take his licks. <laughs> I take my licks. I don't think so. But I, like, I found this whole segment. I didn't like the text on the screen but at first, but Devil Lighting. Talking about AWIT support included was a bit of a Dragon Gaiden Sega cleanup job of the devil mess. I thought, like, I honestly thought this was uh, MJF saying it's Scooby Doo. The uh, commentators trying to make this, like, apply it back to how this would work in real life. Why is a friggin' devil hacking into the TBS feed? Like, would somebody at Warner not be really annoyed that their TV show and that, you know. That, to me, was them trying to, like, square all this off a little bit, which has been necessary. And I enjoyed that they did it. Yeah, like, answer, Even though I still think it's pretty lame. Answer those critics and show that maybe you're still trying to apply a bit of pro wrestling thought to this, as we will get to next in uh, something that I don't think... I don't think I'm chasing... A, it might be a red herring, but I don't think I'm chasing a daft lead with the, the very next thing on the show and a specific detail about one of the wrestlers. Uh, I was quietly impressed with this like it is a bit weird when da hacker is like and these are devils and they've got like all of these sort of terrifying powers and they're in mjf's head and who knows what they're doing to anybody faces in a tag match like it makes me think of not so much early anderson's black scorpion but it's early anderson's shock master not when he's fallen over not when he's like the hat you know i know that's silly but it's like he puts that on it's like what is this man from space and time in the future gonna say hey, you want a piece of me like <laughs> that's a bit weird because yeah. like, he not got some more like outlandish threats yeah. oh, come on you want a piece of me like that you, you want a tag match that feels a bit off like, like if you, you could do midnight rock and roll midnight's rock and roll you could do, like, FTR DIY, books, Lucha Bros, in terms of how good the moves look. Yeah. If they look like that, yeah. it's a, a failure from the opening yeah. bell. Like, if they're going to say, watch your back, next week we'll take you out, that's what they do, right? Yeah. They attack from behind, they throw people through glass, that's fine. Like, 
one of them might have to grab the, grab a hold. They might have to hold the tag rope. Remember when the day Ed debuted? Oh, God. And I they know. have to, like, tag in and out. It's like the, like Aubrey Edwards. They might have to adjust their masks. Devil mask, you're not the legal devil. Like, you have to, it, that bit of it is a bit silly. The big thing that came to my mind the moment they said, let's have a tag match. Let's have a bare knuckle fight next week, <laughs> was, uh, do you remember in the Aces and Eights angle where they'd be like, the baby faces would get one of them and they'd be, like, holding him going, who are you? And I'm like... Take down the map. They've got like a thing. Yeah. Just pull that down. So, so next week, what's stopping them from just going, take your, yeah. take your mask off? Or, and it, or it, it, not only that, after presumably MJF and Joe win, tell Joe to put one of them in the coquina clutch and they'll kill them unless they tell them who the devil is. A match is re- potentially very dumb. Very dumb. Dangerous. Potentially. Dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. But hey, let's not step on our own dick for the preview. <laughs> Who just did? Yeah. <laughs> Ow! <laughs> uh, Wardlow versus AR Fox, uh, to, to your point, came next. Um, Fox, arguably with the best performance against Wardlow since he returned. <laughs> Wardlow, that is, because he actually got some offense in. Clocked Wardlow on the apron with a big boot, big dive, somersault plancher. Uh, he tried that step up moonsault from the apron, but Wardlow just caught him and went, all right. My turn now. Slams him on the apron, uh, and then the bell officially rings. Big Beal, uh, not not Ricky Stark's partner, as in a throw, um, <laughs> from Wardlow on Fox. Chases him around the or stalks him around the floor, chucks him back into the ring onto his head. Uh, Fox gets out of a gorilla press, takes out the legs and hits a four fifty. We can only get a one count. And he's like, did all that in a one count? I'm in for a long night, and yeah, Wardlow starts no selling stuff. Spine buster, big wind up lariat, two power bombs, massive sent on, and then a sort of last ride power bomb. Uh, and the ref just goes, "All right, that that'll do, that'll do, lads." If this is a red herring on this Wardlow thing, it's a very good one, and it's the AW you like and the one you want. He, I know he comes out now, and he looks really pissed off, and that's Wardlow's deal. He looks grumpy, Wardlow. He looks specifically flustered and annoyed. I thought it was a little bit of acting from Wardler here. Mm. To go with his something about Mary hair gel messed up hair, as if to suggest that maybe a, a, under mask, a, mask. a mask has literally just been pulled off and then he makes you go and rewatch the footage again, which I did, and the guy that's holding the bat that Joe pulls out was a pretty stacked fella who could well be Wardler. Like, the body's, like, again, you're taking a risk with this, aren't you? Because people are going to analyse this in detail. Mm-hmm. It's like, I could definitely be Wardler. And now here he is, oh, I'm going to single it and, like, my hair's a mess and whatever, and that didn't go to plan, and now AR Fox is going to be wanting to suffer for this. It was a good acting job by Wardlow, even if it's not him. It's mm. a, a good, and we know, you know, that he's in this universe. I like that, and I want th- to Sidgwick's very specific complaint: suspects, people are actually involved in this. You're supposed to be thinking about it, and that's where AW. I like it because it's like who's in the mask. I like the Fed. Who's in the who's in the mask? <laughs> Just want they what's should, in the box. I want, yeah, what's in the box? Right. I want mystery and skits. I don't want matches. And but what I'll, ideally you get is both. And. This made me question if, like, how involved is Wardlow and thus I'm caring about the devil and thus I'm thinking about it. The, on the AEC aid, AR Fox's fall is pretty depressing. Like, I know it was a visa issue or whatever it was, but, like, this man was going to be working Wembley. And I think you need to... Well, it's a visa issue. It's a withholding the truth so, issue. I, I think, anyway. Mm. You, From what I've heard and read... I just feel like it's whenever you have a Wardlow run, like with... Ryback and others like him. You start with squashing jobbers, then you move up and you squash slightly bigger names and so on. I don't know. Like, I just, I felt it last week in the setup. I was a bit like, oh, all right then. Like, AR Fox is there. It was the most stupidest of setups for this specific squash. And I don't think at any point AR Fox has been the right man for this, mm. this thing. I just didn't feel as fun. I wanted it to just, I wanted to enjoy and revel in Wardlow's violence and. John Cruiser could have been. Yeah. I felt sympathy for AR Fox really more than I did, like, fist clenching. Violence for, like, bloodlust for Wardlow. Uh, Excalibur, they show us the footage of Dante Martin's horrible injury uh, in March uh, at Ring of Honor, of course. Didn't need to see it again. And that's why they told you to turn away. Yeah. Uh, Horrible. Horrible. But the main thing is... Sorry, sorry, this, by the way. This is really gruesome. Zero rehab. And here he is, right here. (laughs) Like, welcome back, asshole. Did you... uh, I missed all this, obviously. I missed the preview yesterday. Did you know the match heading into... Dante Martin's hometown return. No. Good. I'm glad I've got that button ready for you then, Sige. You know what? I'm going to be nice. It was. This was nice, so I'm going to be nice. Top flight and action Andretti uh, versus Brothers A and Matt and Jeff Hardy. Yeah. I thought it was a good and nice thing. 
Uh, he didn't push the button while well, we've been pushing his buttons for years. <laughs> think about think about that, man. Life is a soundboard maybe, in a way. He's learning something, man. <laughs> no! 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 Live, you get a b b b boner, you die. <laughs> Jeff Hardy on the soundboard. Uh, that's a good potential. <laughs> oh, suck my cat. <laughs> Darkness to my cock. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> so early on, we get signature Hardy's double team offense. Uh, eventually, Dante though gets the tag in. I often think about life's mysteries, man. It's a bloody good quiz. <laughs> I'll tell you what, he would work really uh, well. Life is a bloody good quiz. No, I was stood at the top of that ladder and I just thought, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I do you know be really good with it. Yeah, sometimes you look at life and you think, is it door? <laughs> <laughs> Matt was asking me, you want pistachios or cashews? You going to finish those? I'll have these nuts. <laughs> Sometimes Matt kind of loses his way in matches, and I have to say to him, pay attention, please. <laughs> uh, nice, uh, match. nice match. <laughs> what are you looking for? Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move on. We've got 23 minutes. <laughs> uh, I mean, folks, who wears the line? <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, Dante comes in. Huge oh, gap. Gosh. Lovely to see that. Top flight double teams. It's been a long time since we've been able to say that. Action Andre comes in for picture in picture. Uh, and the Hardys and Brothers A take over. Matt hates Andre with his, Andre with a side effect when we come back. Uh, Twister Fake is Me and Matt versus the Young Bucks. Not another one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, Double down. I was doing a you. I couldn't listen to that. Uh, I was like, well, I'm in the buttons. What are we doing? Another hot tag to Dante. He backflips out of the ropes and nails Zay with strikes. Uh, Jeff tries to get Dante on the apron, but he hits a springboard crossbody on Zay. Um... Zay actually sends both Martins into each other, nearly gets a roll-up, gets a two-count, uh, and Zay launches off Jeff's back and hits a drop kick to send Darius to the floor, and they get Dante up in a doomsday position, and Zay springboard drop kick for two. Uh, but Darius and Andretti fights the Hardys on the floor. Zay gets hit with a shotgun drop kick, snap German, spinning side slam. Dante Martin gets a win on his return. I will say, right, when I was watching Moxley versus Lethal, and they were doing the lower uh, left-hand graphics for the matches... I did see that they were going to do Axton Andretti and Top Flight versus Hardy Party, and my initial internal monologue reaction was, no, <laughs> no, no, no. But, but Danny Martin's back, and it was in uh, Minnesota, wasn't it? It was his hometown, yes. yeah. home state, whatever. And you're reminded, this is why people kind of fight for AEW more than they probably would for, like, you know, the other promotions yeah. that they've sort of fallen out of love with. Like, this promotion just often does plain, nice stuff. Even when, like, Eddie Kingston was de-pushed on television, they still was still give him, like, his dream matches. Mm. I mean, he's worked Shibata, he's worked Akiyama, they've, ha- they've arranged to have him meet Kawada. Like, it's just a nice company, fundamentally. Mm. This is a nice thing for them to do. And I thought, for reasons that were inadvertent and on purpose, I had a good time with this match. Like, it was all built around Dante Martin and his hot tags, as it should have been, and they were amazing to see. He was sharp, at ease, confident. Just really enjoyed watching him do what he does. Watching Top Flight together do what they do. I and, you know, actually, Andretti was there as well. <laughs> and um, also, <laughs> also, right, here's the inadvertent element, right? Near the finish, when they're doing like this tandem moves and the aerials, and then, oh, last minute saves, right? <laughs> realistically, the Hardys could have been you know, completely aware of what they were doing, right? And they might have timed it perfectly. There's never any doubt, right? But, like, they're so slow that when it, the layout called upon them to break up a pin, I'm thinking, huh. oh, God. Yeah. Like, 
Because it's the Hardys. <laughs> and I don't necessarily trust them to be able to move. <laughs> That when they did the like the two point nine nine kickouts, it was like a Carter at Dominion twenty eighteen. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, can you get there? I, I don't believe that you can get there in time. So it was like this inadvertent, super dramatic match almost by the finish, running by a tortoise. Yeah, Come on, help! Come on. <laughs> I did think you know they do the bit where like it's one of them goes like on their hands and knees and the one jumps off their back. Mm. The one on the hands is like, oh, oh, thank God for this. Oh God, actually, I'm just a platform for someone else. I forgot about that part. <laughs> Still just heading. This is running. It's like two point nine two point nine nine head in for an item. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean that's what it's like that, but like not the good kind, but a kind yeah. of it. So it was, uh, I'm the one who's being a cynical dickhead about this really nice match. It was nice and I would agree as well. Um sort of vital for top flight to be as good as they were in flashes here mm. because these injuries they've been so unlucky. It's it's both of them that have gotten hurt, isn't it? I'm right there. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like it, was these, like, it, was, it was really cursed in terms of one would yeah. come back and then, yeah. Like, they're the, the sort of injuries where a team like them could have been ruined, basically. Yeah. And oh, now yeah. they've both recovered. And on the first night back, it goes really well, they're as you say. They're freaks. Yeah. Like How can they still move like that? It, it was nice, and it was a bit of a relief to watch this play out the way mm. it did. Uh, after that, Renee's backstage with him celebrating um, and asks, asks Dante about his leg before he can say anything, though. Here comes Penta. Uh, who says, zero me eight him. <laughs> <laughs> Commander and Vikingo, they set up another awesome trios match. Oh, this wasn't awesome, so it couldn't be another one. Yes, sorry. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I was nice <laughs> about it, but it wasn't awesome. But, you know, Penta was the one who put them through it, and mm. that's nice. This yeah. is good. This is quite good. Um, uh, uh, let me just double check my notes here. Oh, I'm the only winner. Yeah, my God. Nah, yeah. Who could have seen this coming? Julia Hart versus Emi Sakura for the TBS title. It's time to play the game! Time to play, time the, to game. play the game! Ha 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 ha! Did it, did it, did it, did it! We played bingo! Yeah. On the Dynamite preview and all the collision review where we basically went through. I think there was one very recent episode of AWTV that we were previewing, maybe Collision, at which time there was no mm. match for the women's division, singular, never <laughs> <for> plural, <laughs> announced, and we played... Bingo! It was like, oh, probably Emi Sakura. Yeah, it was Lady Frost on Collision, uh, and then we said after that, there's basically like, there's a, we can have a wheel that we could just bring in following that. It's usually Nyla Rose immediately after winning. Oh, you know, title. like, not Wheel of Fortune, we've just established the conceit of this. It's... Oh, yeah. Bingo! It's like a little card. Like, with the grid and stuff. <laughs> so it's not a wheel, mate. No, but then we could just spin... They could, they, it's they, not they, Wheel of Fortune! No, they, it's they, bingo! They spin a wheel to pick who the opponent oh, the, is. Johnny Gargano over here. <laughs> <laughs> Loves wheels. Anyway, so you play bingo, and, like, how to get houses? Yes. yes. you got Emi Sakura... Nyla Rose, um, Taya Marina Valkyrie. Shafir, Taya Valkyrie. No, no, she's all right. she's having her. Um, she's had a Bobby Fish run, sadly. Oh, wow. In it for ages. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> but there's like three or four. It's yeah. all like it's. This is just the Statlander run. Mm. She had uh, she had Emmy Sakura in like a six minute match very early in the rain. Yeah, and now you know Julia Hart does as well. That's a bloody. It's a damn shame. But this is under house rules. Oh, different. Uh, no it's submissions. So, no frigging submissions. They have worked so hard, and Julia Hart has worked hard with them to establish a character that, like, she can do, actually, and she's really, like, young as well. So it's like, wow, like, she's actually quietly built herself up on the sly in matches that you've never seen on Dark and Dark Elevation, and she's got this actual killer submission move, and she's in this dumbass stable that decides to have rules that work against them in their big matches. Oh, God, I, I hate it. <laughs> They're so the House of Black promotion. The House of Black are stupid guys. <laughs> well, they are. They are, and Brody King was best off away from him because I finally watched that collision match over the weekend. Oh my god, I'm going to kick ass. Yeah. Push Pick that Kingston match, kick day. Yes. Get him away from his goth mates. <laughs> uh, so Hart hits an early handspring clothesline and poses and Sakura fires off some chops because she's pissed off with that. Uh, Sakura gets slammed it's to the It's such a lame, we're so hard thing, mm. isn't it? Yeah. Be with both hands tied behind our backs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, like, yeah, yeah. You know, you, it's up to you. I mean, we'll yeah. kick your ass regardless. We'll put the rules in your favor, baby face. Yeah. <laughs> what? 
Well, uh, my House of Black rule of choice is that when we get in the ring, you have to lie down for four seconds. <laughs> ring the bell. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> that's my... I've chosen. You said I could have a rule. Yeah. I'm not Dolph Ziggler, eh? <laughs> like, you have... Uh, you have to get a five count, and I have to get a one count. Yeah. It's it's so dumb. It's so stupid. And yeah, I hate that. It's not just dumb because you can... Uh, plot hole ridden. You can do these stupid games about which gimmick it would be. But, like, it's like, how hard are we? Uh, just, uh, you know, do what you want. <laughs> Yeah. Still gonna, we're still going to kick your ass. <laughs> Bob Holly. <laughs> but worse. <laughs> House of Bob. The House of Bob. <laughs> House of Hardcore. I think that's trademark. That's Dreamers Company, isn't it? H-O-F-N-H. <laughs> uh, oh. 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 Uh, the biggest fans are called Hobots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hard got sent into the steps with a, and there's a low cross body to take us to break. When we come back... Julia <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sakura missed the top rope moonsault. Heart, hotter and heartless. <laughs> Sakura tapped on the ref was like, no submissions. <laughs> Brett the Hitman. Hard. <laughs> Hard <laughs> oh, <laughs> Yeah, um, Julie Hart got the submission, but there's no submissions. <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> I, I, I think less of everything and everyone It's now. a good job you've got magic goo, because the rest of the rules is stupid. Uh, well, I think there was some magic powers in, in play here, because Hart hit a lariat to the back, and it's like, oh, Sakura's in position for the top rope moonsault. And I thought, as she jumped, I was like, oh my God, Sakura's going to move into a better position to get hit with a moonsault. Um, one, two, she three. just didn't want Julie Hart to... She didn't want to, like... That was the finish. Yeah. Yes. So she didn't want to, like, get pinned off nothing. Yeah. So she was like, how can I look a little bit less stupid here? All right, okay, I'll willingly take a punch to the face. Equivalent of. Uh, uh, yeah. Wretched. The, the, you know, the, the, Heart retains, yeah. Yeah, terrible finish. Like, in, like a completely flawed stipulation. Total... <laughs> oh, bingo! Uh, I'm so, I hate it so much. Yeah, a shame, a real shame. Really into Julie Hart this year, and this she's won. Give her. She's won a belt. At which point the booking fails you. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, well, before we move on, as that was the only women's match, uh, it's time to play the game, but not that game. Um, before we get to the name of the game, what's the aim of the game, Sid? The aim of the game is to identify to the hour, minute, minute and second the first. Note of the first entrance theme for the first women's wrestler to appear for the only women's match on Dynamite. And the idea is that nine times out of ten, it's usually in this slot, the penultimate match on the card. And it's just like, time to get the bloody women out. And you know what they say? When the women come out to play, the men ain't too far away. It's so basically, uh, I know you gotta watch women, lads, but like, sorry, the main event's coming on soon. And it's hideous. And I hate it. And we play this game every single week, twice actually. Mm -hmm. Well, once, but I do the thing twice. <laughs> just to put bold, italicize, underline just how much of a pathetic, transparent optics exercise this is. And it's useless at that as well because it's even more obvious. That's the aim of the game. The name of the game is well, this is ladies' night. And I'm thinking, ooh, what a night. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Done. You're going left and he goes right every time. Uh, thank you, as always, to Adam oh, Blair. You can never stand still. I've got kids. <laughs> <laughs> at Adam Wilton 4 on Twitter and Jose Palomares at the Ho 11 who always take care of the um, data. Thank you for this sort of thing. Uh, one hour, 17 minutes and 46 seconds. Is that you, Sid? You got that one? That's a win for Sid, I think. I, I, think went, fir I went first hour like a mug. You idiot. A mug. Stupid idiot. <laughs> He does say honourable oh. mention to Adam Wilborn, whose guess of one hour, 27 minutes and 19 seconds was a fraction off the finish of the match. Do I get anything for that? Nope. No, you don't okay. get a goddamn thing. Uh, uh, yeah, we've already established that this is correct, isn't it? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, uh, so I don't actually have to check my phone. I'm just doing it. Okay. Uh, seven correct guesses for the year for me. Hamlet's on nine, Sidge is on 11, which Ooh, means... Almost uncatchable. Almost uncatchable. I think we've got two more to play, so... Now you've got my name engraved on the trophy. Yeah. <laughs> they could put the Michael in now, can't they? Yeah, yeah, they can put the Michael in now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then we got the 
Oh. We got the Mariah May bit. And then here comes Christian Cage, uh, who calls out Adam Copeland to come to the ring. And uh, I think it's his gimmick now. He takes his sweet time getting out there, basically. But he comes out, a security are there. And uh, Cage is like, oh, I didn't want the security. Management said we had to have it. Actually, <laughs> piss off. Um, and he says, look, with regard to your challenge, December 6th, Montreal, we're not going to make it. But we're not going to make it because I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I love him. Not because you took out the Prodigy Nick Wayne or Lucha so Kill Switch, and the crowd obviously react to that. Uh, he says, look, I saw what you did to them, and I was so bloody angry. I got in the car and just, just started driving. But then when I was on that drive, <laughs> <laughs> and did a lot of, uh, of soul-searching, a lot of reflection. I uh, was wondering uh, how I got the way that I am. He said, I remember driving the roads with you, Adam, in Toby the Taurus, and... Uh, how we, you know, we had nothing to our name. We dreamed of making it big and becoming the greatest t tag team in history, which we did. Uh, but it runs deeper than that. You, of course, Adam, grew up with a single mother. You didn't have a father figure. And everyone's like, oh, no, don't do it. He's like, oh, I might be the patriarch of AW, but I'm not I'm not your father. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. It's just dad. It's <laughs> such good crack. I love it. I'm not your father. I'm your brother. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love him. He's the best. He said, look, my... my you know, my dad was there for you. You know, he treated you as one of our own. Uh, he's still your biggest fan. Uh, I love you, Adam. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I know that before your mother sadly passed away, she wanted us to team together just just one more time. <laughs> oh, what a, that is the best. Why don't we have one final run for Judy, eh? <laughs> and Adam, uh, Adam Copeland's like sort of overwhelmed with what he's heard. And as he's thinking about this, you just see Cage put the mic down and just, ah, let's get rid of him. <laughs> this bell into the back of the head with a belt. Goes to hit him. Uh, but Adam Copeland kicks him in the cock. And as Cage slides down, Copeland kicks on the mic and says, nice try, dumbass. Uh, why don't you shine that Etienne title up real nice? Because next week, she's coming home with me. Oh, and one final thing. Go f*** yourself. <laughs> and that was not censored whatsoever. In my, on my version... The bit afterwards sounded like the bit in Big Brother when they used to be like, oh, God, we've got to hear that conversation. Yeah. Let's go to the chicken coop. But they missed their <laughs> thing completely. Play some bird noises quick. Yeah. yeah. But they completely missed the actual swears. I've, I've already heard it. Yeah. Um, I've seen everything. I've heard yeah. everything. <laughs> Match is official for next week. Uh, one, uh, this is, uh, I love this segment so goddamn much. Like, what an absolutely incredible idea it was to mirror the first Copeland promo. And, you know, I, I'm... I'm a cynical guy, right? People see a three and a half star match and enjoy it because it's above average. I see something that isn't a four, right? People see a push, I think, oh, never going to last. I'm just cynical, right? So maybe this is just my sort of, just my disposition manifesting yet again. But like, did you not notice that Christian Cage said all of these things after Kill Switch and Nick Wayne have been taken out? Mm. And there's no one, there's no one left to protect him. It's yeah. just weird, that isn't it? I mean, that's up, up, that is two old pros telling like impeccable heel work. Exactly, like, what a worm, what a horrible worm he is, trying to manipulate him by talking about his dead mother. Right, that's that's the genius of Christian. There are actual layers to this. It's this absolutely sort of like sick soap opera. All of this, right? And he does it because it's like really blackly funny. The, you know, your dad's dead and all the rest of it. This is like an actual layer to it. Ah, oh, dad thought this was absolutely magnificent the way they mirrored everything. And Christian Cage is just so funny, yet not so funny that you don't still think, oh, you little bastard. <laughs> that you worm. Like the timing of this, oh, I just thought this was magnificent. I cannot wait for this match as well. I think it'd be really, really good. If it's more Christian than Copeland. This was the proper stuff. This, like when he said old pros, this was in terms of construction and performance right down to how quickly Christian pivoted in the ready, the clocking with the belt, the second he turns his back. Every single aspect of this was why, in theory, you should get your hands on as many legendary figures as possible to help create these and then perform them. Wrestlers tend to ruin it by carny in the way and roles they don't deserve. But when it all goes right, you get oh, this, yeah. this is the benefit laid bare. Magic. Really, really good stuff. Uh, it was, yeah, it was the equivalent of begging off 
like someone cowering in the corner and going, no, nah, like they say when he's all of his friends have been beaten up, but he's actually sitting on his shoulder, whispering in his ear, come on, what would your mum want us to do? It's just, what a git. It's just mad. I've just changed his mind yeah. now of all times. I've had a think. Yeah. <laughs> now I've lost everyone. Well, I'm trying to appeal to Edge's, Copeland's corny side as well, just took out driving all that long. <laughs> <laughs> Told me the to Taurus. <laughs> Uh, and the main event was uh, the final match in the Continental Classic Gold League for this week. Swerve Strickland versus Switchblade Jay Watt. Um, we got a Prince Nana dance, although with a crutch. <laughs> uh, Strickland comes out to the ring by himself after that, obviously. Um, and they well, White takes the fight outside early on, but Strickland fires back and launches him into a barricade. Running stomp to the back off the apron. Um, but uh, Strickland takes too long to follow up and Swerve gets hit with a DDT through the ropes to take us to picture in picture. When we come back, Swerve fights back. Uh, head scissors, rolling flatliner, spinning suplex for two. Uh, they both slowly get to their feet and White hits a flatliner, dropping him right on his head. Um, White hits a snap German and that allows uh, Strickland to recover because he takes too long. Uh, big old lariat for another double down. Uh, chop block to Swerve's leg allows White to hit a Uranagi for two. Uh, White almost gets sent into the referee, and just like last week, tries for a low blow, but Swerve, being the fellow heel that he is, knows exactly what's coming. Catches it, hits a slam, hits the house call kick and the Swerve stomp, but White kicks out. Uh, he bites at the hand of Swerve, a sort of desperation blade runner out of nowhere, but that, the force of it spills Strickland out to the floor. White brings him back inside. They sort of trade near falls. They both go for their finishers. Um, they are banging on a commentary, I should say, by the way, about the, the time limit and the, the, the time announcements going on. I think we're about 15 minutes in at this point. You think, oh, okay, they're just going to go into an over and it's going to go to a draw. Uh, White hits a sleeper suplex, but as he's going for the Blade Runner, Strickland out of nowhere, flash pin, roll up, one, two, three, swerve goes to six points. Yeah, um, weird dynamic, which kind of... I was removed from the match because it's like, you know, I'm not that much of a basic bitch. I've talked as well about how baby face and heels and it's all a bit, you know, antiquated, realistically. Mm. There probably should be a new way that wrestling should evolve because heat, as it once was, is impossible. Blah, blah, blah. As it stands, that's what they go for. That's how my mind's wired. So when you see two heels go at it, you still have that weird disconnect. Mm. Like these very rarely work live. So this match was they basically had to present it as a shootout, like because it was structurally like couldn't work in the normal mm. way, if you like. And it relied almost entirely on just total great execution. And the last five minutes were just so wonderfully executed in terms of the moves, like how impactful it felt, how gnarly everything looked. Um, so I really enjoyed the last five minutes, even if the last five minutes were di disconnected from the first ten. Mm. So there's no real emotional heft. You're not struck. You're not watching anyone struggle. You're not sympathising with anyone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but uh, the last five minutes were exhilarating. Relied on pure execution, and that's what they gave you. One more thing: if Jay White had it, he could be the best of all time. Unfortunately, he doesn't. Uh, he does everything he's supposed to do, like so immaculately, positioning, footwork, like even the little things where. The idea is you don't want to walk into moves. You don't want to, like... And you see the absolute horrible extreme of this. Like, I didn't think it was as bad as X made out, but maybe I'm just desensitized to it. But that Wesley, Johnny Gargano sequence in the in the Fatal 4-Way on NXT, when they're, like, doing that soulless dance, basically, of, yeah. choreogra of choreography. Like, that was the antithesis of Jay White. Like, he will flail and struggle and hate the idea of, like, panicked, I don't want to take this move. Yeah. He's really good at that. Oh. Um, so this is well crafted for what it was, but what it was was a bit weird. But because it's these two, it transcended weird, I guess. Yeah, I was quite impressed with this. I thought they'd go more pantomime mm. and there wouldn't be the need to uh, even even have a wrestling match, really, or find a heel and babyface by both trying to out-cheat each other. The Jericho-MJF match. Yeah, those, those are ago, quite yeah. fun matches and you can't do them all the time and you can't necessarily land on characters that can justify it. Jay White has won his first match. with. I really like that MJF-Jericho one. Mm. Yeah. Full gear... Uh, yeah, 2020. And it's like, it makes good use of characters, doesn't it? Like, Jay White won with a low blow last week. Swerve is swerve right now. You absolutely could have done that. And I thought it was quite bold to leave most of that alone and just try and out-wrestle each other. Um, there's a sort of, 
honour among thieves, mutual respect between the way they were wrestling it. I'm really intrigued in a good way with what they're doing with Swerve's booking right now. He has come out of the Hangman Page match as probably one of the hottest heels in wrestling. And on this trajectory that we have all projected onto him, this man has to win the world title. It feels hot when there is heat around a wrestler. There's almost nothing like it. You, It's inevitable. He had mm. that around him. And I was trying to think of a heel in wrestling history where they've then like shifted slightly and used where he can go as this way to kind of like force you to respect them. And I was thinking about heel Sean winning the Rumble from number one. Like it was a 30 minute Rumble and Mo lasted 20 seconds, but ignore all that. It was to win the Rumble from number one, it's like, I hate him, but he's good. And they're showing you through pro wrestling and pro wrestling alone that he's really good. This tournament is that for Swerve. Like he has come off this match Top heel in the company, a champion elect in 2024. And there, he's not going to be this crazy pantomime heel throughout it. He's going to remind you over the course of these matches that he can go, that he's mm-hmm. got the lot. And then after the tournament, or however the tournament ends, maybe Hangman costs him, maybe, whatever. Something will occur that maybe stops Swerve winning and that sends him off on his next direction. You are going to just have quietly him built in the back of your mind. He's kind of the best wrestler as well. He's, mm. if there was one little bit that was undeniable, that is uh, that was still deniable, that is no longer the case. And I think that's... Like, that's what his purpose is in this tournament, and I felt it here. I think by the end, Swerves, if you didn't already think it, you're going to realise that he's got the lot, and that's what you want in a world champion if it's all elite wrestling. Mm. Well, let us know your thoughts on AEW Dynamite in the comments section below or on X at What Culture WWE. Watch, they can follow all three of us. You can follow Michael Hamflit at... Michael Hamflit. Follow Michael Sidgwick at... M. Sidgwick. Follow me at Adam Wilborn. Uh, follow our brilliant producer at It's Adam Nicholas. Follow us all at What Culture WWE. Make sure you subscribe to What Culture Wrestling uh, wherever you get your podcasts from for daily wrestling podcasts. Me and Sidge will be back tomorrow. All going well. To preview <laughs> AEW Collision. But for now, this has been the AEW Dynamite review. Is my anxiety funny to you? My <laughs> bit. I think yeah. I think it's your delivery of it. <laughs> well, thanks to Michael Hamlet to Michael Sidgwick. Thank you for joining us. And we will see you soon. <laughs>